because the days are evil. When you look at this passage, the, the Christian life can be lived functionally dead. And, and, and that's the concern. And that's, that's why we want to understand our thinking process and change our thinking process. We don't want to live as though we're dead. We want to awake. We want to arise from the dead. Um, and, and when you look at this passage, you can kind of look at it two different ways. I think both are, are actually fairly uh, true and very consistent with the context. If you look in verse 14, where he says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. Well, you can take that, you know, awake from thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. Quit acting like you're dead, and Christ will give you light. And I think that's, the, the context would bear that out. The other way to look at that is say, Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. Come out from amongst the dead. Don't be partakers with those that are lost, and Christ will give thee light. If you look earlier in the, in the passage, you know, he's talked about our conduct and how we're supposed to be, and we're not to be partakers and, and do, with the children of disobedience and do the works the works of darkness. So the main thing I, what I want to see us to see here is there is a concern that even though we're saved, we can walk as though we're not. The only way to prevent that is to make sure our thinking process is in align with God's thinking process. We want to use the Bible, use God's viewpoint. We don't want to use human viewpoint. And as we all know, it's so easy to get sucked into that, that human viewpoint. And if, you, if you're not on guard, just like you can put yourself back into the law that quick, you can start accepting human viewpoint that quick. And then a lot of times you don't even realize you've done it. And you go, oh, wait a second. That's what I think, but what does the Word of God think? And, and you need to respond positively, if you can put it that way, to, to the, the conviction you get from, from the Word of God. Um, we're not to live like other Gentiles do, in the vanity of our mind, with that darkened understanding. Because that darkened understanding alienates us from the life that is uh, in God. We're to live... In our identity in Christ, we are to live unto God. Um, we are to walk according to who we are in Christ, not who we were in Adam. Now, the only way that we can find out about our identity in Christ, the only way we can find out who we are, is through the Word of God. It's not something that, it's, it's something that when the moment you get saved, you have no idea about. You know, you got saved, you're not going to hell, wahoo. But then you get into the Word of God and you say, wow, look at all these things that I am in Christ. Now that I'm saved... I'm, I'm holy, I'm accepted in the beloved, I'm considered the elect of God, I, I've got all spiritual blessings in, in uh, heavenly places. And all these things that go on and on, I, I've got complete total forgiveness. And you start to understand some of these things, and then you can ask, okay, with all that in mind, I need to live a certain way. It, but it's not in the legalistic way, you don't live, live in such a manner so that you can get the blessings. You've already got everything you've got, you've got those blessings, now you're going to go live with a heart of appreciation live in your identity in Christ, you understand who you are in Christ, and then you, you live out of that. Um, look over at Job 38 and verse 2. We talked a couple weeks ago about that issue of light getting in into us. Uh, Job 38. The Christian life is to be lived as Jesus Christ lived, in total, complete reliance on the Word of God. Somebody... The Christian life is to be lived as Jesus Christ lived, in total, complete reliance on the Word of God. He did everything according to the will of His Father, according to the Word of God. And, and you, you can see that. He was daily communing in prayer with His Father. He understood the Scriptures. He's God, so this is an obvious statement. But he understood the Scriptures that talked about Him. And he did everything he did in accordance with the will of God. Um, and he talks about that over and over again. I can do nothing except that my Father has me do it. And the issue there is not that, well, he doesn't know what to do. The issue is he's just completely relying on the will of his Father. And he gave his Father the glory, too, because he'd always say, you know, my Father that sent me, he was always saying, going back to not doing my Father's will, right. very obedient. Glorify me that you may be glorified. Yeah. Exactly. So look at Job 38, too. So how do, you know, our thinking. We're, we're not God. We're not going to be Jesus Christ. But our thinking is what we're talking about. Job 38, verse... Two. Verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? When you reject truth, the spiritual impact to your inner man is darkness. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You accept words without knowledge, your counsel becomes darkened. There's no light in you. You've got to have the word of truth working in you. Because blindness is exactly what we want to stay away from. Right? Anybody, anybody can walk in blindness. 
you don't have to be saved to walk with dark and understanding. And that's not why we get saved, and I understand that. But we want to stay away from blindness and from darkness. And we do that by accepting the truth and then applying it intelligently to the details of our life. So then the question is, well, where's the truth? Look over at 2 Timothy 2.15. The Word of God, I hope is no surprise to those of us here tonight, is the truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. First thing you need to look at is you study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Now this is not the issue where, okay, God, I'm studying, I want you to see me studying, and I want your approval. It's not, it's, it's not that. This is the issue. We are, we, we're already approved of God. We are already accepted in the Beloved. We're, we're study so that we are that workman. Okay? Study to show thyself approved unto God. It's that issue that, okay, I understand who I am in Christ, and this is what the will of God for me today is. It's to study. It's to study His Word. To live a life that's pleasing unto God. The only way you can live a life pleasing unto God is to rely on this as the final authority. Does that, does that make sense? The next part of that is, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Yeah. Get, get any uh, acceptance with God. It's not right? to get acceptance. There is an issue. Now, there is also that issue of, of reward. Mm -hmm. If you get saved, and you, and you get saved, it's a genuine salvation, and you do nothing with it, you're still going to go to heaven, but you're going to suffer loss. Not, not negative stuff, but you, you're, the opportunity you had for reward will, will be lost. You will, you will not have that. And that's, if you don't study, if you're not that workman, that's what's going to happen. Does that make sense? Or did I confuse the issue? I think it confused me. Um, but yet, you study the Word of God so that you understand who you are in Christ, so that you are that workman. You don't need to be ashamed because you're standing on the truth. You're going to take attacks. You're going to take, you're going to take many, many attacks. But if you stand on the Word of God, you're not going to need to be ashamed. Now, we're going to look at that too when we get over in, into... Uh, Romans 5, 3, 4, 5, and 6, we're going to talk about we're going to, the end of some of that stuff is not being ashamed. Because we do have the love of God shed abroad in our heart. Well, also, I, I think you won't be ashamed because uh, you'll understand what God wrote and you'll understand what God wrote. So there's just knowledge. You don't be, be ashamed of not knowing things, understanding things, or being confused. You, you know because you, you're right, you divide it. And you also know the, the power comes from God, not, not ourselves. It's, it, it's this issue. Look over at, we're going to come right back, but look at Titus 2. We'll just jump into verse 1. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound auction. And then he comes down and talks about all these things. Verse 5, the point of which is that the word of God be not blasphemed. And then he gets down to verse 8. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. You're not going to be ashamed because though people may say something evil of you, it won't have any merit to it. You can stand in the Word of God and say, I know what the Word of God says. I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ along with what Paul did because you've studied this. If you haven't... Because it's, because it's truth. The other thing is you will have that conviction that you are standing on the Word of God and not on your own viewpoint. All right? One of the things, and I, I think we've all done it, I know I certainly have, you're, you're saved and you're, you're talking about something maybe, maybe you ought not be talking about because you don't have the knowledge, because you haven't studied that subject out. And you make your point, and then about you get going, and you all of a sudden you realize, you know, I'm talking about human viewpoint here. I've made a stand for something I think the Bible says, and I really don't know if it says it or not. And you, that, there's an issue where you can be, end up being ashamed. That's why one of the reasons why it's so important to study, and I, I, April and I talk about this a lot, for the most part, when you're going to have conversations with people, unless they're a casual conversation, you're going to know who you're talking to. It's usually going to be a friend or a coworker. You're going to know the objections that probably will come up. 
and you can you, you can kind of target your study around that. Now you need to be well rounded in all your study, but you know to to get into a discussion or an argument or however you want to talk about it about especially doctrinal issues, and that's kind of why we're here is this doctrinal issue of something that you haven't studied out. You can end up getting yourself ashamed. You can understand where the word of God is, it does become blasphemed, rightly or wrongly. Whereas if you standing if you're standing in the Word of God and you know what the Word of God says, that shame won't happen. You will understand. So yeah, you'll have an answer. You'll be you'll, you'll be re, you'll be ready with an answer. And that's the thing. And not only is it be ready with an answer, be ready with the answer. Well, and yet study in a specific way, rightly dividing the word of truth. The whole Bible, Genesis, Revelation, is the truth. It's not, you know, I think sometimes people read this and say, okay, rightly dividing, take out 13 books, that's for us, and we'll put the rest of it away. The whole thing is the truth. We rightly divide it to understand where we're at. And I've said this before to you guys, I'll say it again. You'll, you know, Romans 1.1 1, 1 talks about Paul, Jesus Christ, and God. You better have Acts to know who Paul is. You better have the Gospels to know who Jesus Christ is. And Genesis would sure help you know who God is. Right? That's good information to have. Just there is a silly little example, simple little example, of why don't let anybody accuse you of throwing out the rest of the Bible, because we do not. Okay? But you do need to rightly divide it. You need to, you need to understand what is to you, what is for you, what is for you, what is to you and about you, but is not necessarily for you. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so what I want to talk about before we get into this, and this is kind of the last little bit of um, groundwork that we want to look at so that we understand when we, when we come to the Word of God, because we're going to start to see some things. You come into, into Romans, you're going, to see, you're going to find out some things in Romans that are different than what, we, than, than what the Bible has taught coming into Romans. And if, it, it can cause great, great uh, trouble. Well, how does this work? This says one thing, but this says another. Well, there's got to be an answer. God is not the answer, the author of confusion. You know, I've, I've, you know, somebody said, well, you know, there's contradictions in the Bible. Yes, there are. Every time somebody says that to you, you know, take it like this. You just got invited to Bible study. Well, why don't you show me some of the contradictions and we'll go through them. You better have an answer, though, if you're going to yeah. respond like that. Um, so the issue we want to we want to rightly divide the word of truth. Figure out what is specifically to and about us versus what is for us. It's all for learning. Paul is very clear about this. Look over at uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished into all good works. When it says all scripture, it means all scripture. It means all scripture. Paul talks over in the Corinthians, talking about the some of the travails that Israel went through when they came out of Egypt. That stuff was written for our learning. We all the, all the Bible is for us, but there are specific sections, or one specific section that is to and about us. So look over to Ephesians two. Now, and as we go through this, if people have questions, please feel comfortable to ask them. Um, because we, we, we've, a couple weeks ago, we looked at the issue of how we're made up, right? Our, our spirit, soul, and our body. So we know how to, to kind of look at, as when things don't go right, we can kind of look at things. Well, are they, because something happened and we responded inappropriately, was just life sucky that day? Am I, am I responding to my emotions? Am I not getting correct doctrine in? But you've got to be able to know where you're at. That's the importance of what we went through the three circles. It's not just because we have three circles. It's to understand that we can kind of use that as a diagnostic tool. Now we're going to use right division and say, okay, and this is how we apply that to that so that our thinking can be right. So Ephesians 2, verse 11. It says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens, aliens, <laughs> aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Okay, so there's a time 
what Paul calls time past, where we were not part of Israel. God had God was not dealing with the Gentiles, right? And you see it here. Adam's I know you can see it, but Adam was created, goes along, you've got the flood, you've got the Tower of Babel, and then he calls out Abraham. He gives up the Gentiles, calls out Abraham, and eventually they go down to Israel goes down to Egypt, they come out, Moses and Moses brings them out. And God's now dealing with his promised nation up here. The Gentiles he's given up. Okay, that's the time he's talking about right there, right? You see in 13, or uh, 12, being alienates, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That completely describes this time right here. Verse 13, though, but now, that's this area right here. Dispensation of grace. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Because of the cross, not at the cross, but because of the cross, God was able to usher in this dispensation of grace, revealed to the Apostle Paul, a time of grace and peace to the Gentiles today. A time that was never before. Before there was this middle wall of partition. We'll call it this yellow line, this blue line here. This middle wall of partition represented first of all by circumcision and then by the law. Right? Circumcision identified Abraham. It was that sign of the, of the um, covenant that God had made with him. And then when Moses comes out, the Ten Commandments. And we've seen that issue. That, right? the, the statutes and ordinances were to be a testimony that Israel was different. Right, right. They would the the other the other nations would look at Israel and God's statues and say, "Wow, that's a great nation." They were to be that nation of priests. Okay. Yes. Sure. But this is one of those verses. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broke and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And you know the covenant believers or like my church would want to say that. Now the Gentile, the Israel and the body of Christ are now one, not seeing the body of Christ as something separate. And I guess I wouldn't mind what you'd have to say about that. Sure. Look over at Colossians. Neither Jew nor Gentile. What am I, where is it? Thank you. Uh, oh, where's the thing about neither Jew nor Gentile? That sounds right. Yeah. And have put on the new man, which is, re is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. That would be my answer. There is no Israel today because there's no Jew or Gentile today. Now, there's another one. Look over at Romans 11. Because I, I know what they say. They say, okay, how, how do they say it? How did you say it? So Romans 11, 11, I say then, have the, speaking of Israel, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but through their fall, so, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for provo to provoke them to jealousy. For if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the rich of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Israel has fallen. Um, where's the one? Uh, look at, keep, if you keep reading there, um, verse 14, if by any means I may provoke the emulation of them which are my flesh, he's talking to I mean, people that are of Paul's flesh, are physical Jews, and might save some of them. For the cast, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, 
what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Because see, they fell, and now there's great blessing going to the, there's great, uh, how does Paul say it? Uh, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, so they fell, the riches went out to the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So when, they, when, when he restores them again, He's only set the, he has only set them aside. He hasn't gotten rid of Israel. He's going to pick up and deal with Israel again. You see that in 15. If the casting away of them be in the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So they were cast away so that the world could be reconciled. But he's going to receive them again. And then, but life from the Yes. Verse three, and it's a it's a good point because people want to make this this whole passage about the individual believer, and it's actually a doctrinal, a dispensational setting. So, verse twenty three, it says, "And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again." Verse twenty five, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your conceits, your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from, from Jacob. And the fullness of the Gentiles is this great time. Right, it's the rapture. The rapture that, that issue, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, when God's done with, with, with the dispensation of grace, and the rapture happens, he's going to pick back up his, his program with Israel again. So, and that's the body. He's forming the body. Right. The holders of the body. I love to think about that. And I heard somebody on the, um, I think it was Facebook, and they were talking about the fact that the body is not It's really good. Yeah, look over, keep going here and look at verse 28. Now, you got to understand that verse 28 is, is, is really kind of a time sensitive verse, if you will. It says, As concerning the gospel, they, he's talking about his, his kinsmen, they are enemies for your sake. Well, the, the, the people on the earth that were saved according to the kingdom program, who he's talking about there. There is, there is every Jew that gets saved today, every physical Jew that gets saved today is a member of the body of Christ. Period. Okay? Right. There, 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 there is no, there is no um, Jew that's, that believes in God that is an enemy for the gospel's sake today. Okay? But if you, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching, he's talking about the little flock, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God told these people he was he had, he had a special calling for these people back here. They were going to be that holy nation and that nation of priests, the royal priesthood. He called them. That verse, they are without repentance, says he he will deal with them again. He didn't he didn't put them through all that and then give it because that's what's that's really what's taught, right? They got the curses, we get the blessings. That's what's taught, and that's not that's not the case. They got the cursings and they got a little bit of the blessings, but over here, they're going to get the blessings. They're going to get the blessings that God, that, that God promised them. There's going to be a literal, earthly, Davidic kingdom on earth that they're going to do. All those spiritual blessings that God has promised them in Jeremiah and Isaiah and whatnot, they all will be delivered back to Israel again. Now, we, t we partake of some of those spiritual blessings here, none of the physical blessings. We do take part of some of the spiritual blessings, but the gifts and call, God has set Israel aside at this time. They are not, I mean, you know, that's a great verse. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. That's the little flock. That's believing Israel. Because it's, it's, an opposite, it's an opposite program. You wouldn't go and share that gospel with them because it doesn't mean anything to them. 
Just like, just like the gospel of the kingdom doesn't mean anything to you today. Yeah. No, no. This this is talking. This is talking about the believing nation. Don't go read Galatians. Those were that that was that was the that the, those were the Judaizers. That was the little flock that was trying to put them back under the under the law. Well, that was he was the little flock. I mean, that, that was uh, those those guys were sent from James. Because because right. What's what's the gospel Paul's talking about here? Oh, or gospel of the grace of God. Is that is that the little flock's gospel? No. And what did the little flock? What did the people sent from James try to do? They tried to put back under the law. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and Galatians. I mean, yeah, when he says, you know, I withstood Peter to the face. Go back and read that. He did that because guys came down from James. These weren't Pharisees. These weren't. These were by Old Testament Bible believing members of the little flock. They just didn't get the program, and it it, it has to be because, as he says, as touching the election, they're beloved for the fathers. And to understand what this is, they are beloved for the fathers. That's not God. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See what the apost- See what the apostrophe is. And why are they beloved? Because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God's, God's not offering the kingdom to the apostate nation. He's, a, he's offering the kingdom to the little flock, to the believing remnant. We don't want to think that they were enemies. Because we think of, of, of battle. They were enemies for our sakes. They were, they were, as concerning the gospel, they're, it doesn't say they were our, our enemies. It says concerning the gospel, they're enemies for our sake. It's a different program. Yeah, they were saved under a different program, and then when it came to the to Paul's believers, they they were putting them back under the law. Look over at Galatians. Yeah. Yeah. Taught the brethren and said, "Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved." Right. So those were the teachers of the of the believing brethren, huh. yeah. but they were teaching you have to be circumcised or you're not saved. Is that the gospel yeah. we teach today? No. Would they be the enemy for of the concerning the gospel? Would they be an enemy for our sake? They were. That doesn't that doesn't help us get saved at all, does it? They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So that's when that big problem mm-hmm. happened in that yeah. uh-huh. And that issue, no small dissension and disputation, that means it was a big fight. Yes. yes, right. It was stand up, it was, I'm sure, bitter, and people were pounding the things, and I'm sure somebody had to step in and say, hey, let's take a time out and uh, regroup. Uh, I'm thinking that was a big deal. Um, that's what it was. Yeah. It was the gospel of the kingdom. Because that's what they're going to the temple. They were mm-hmm. they were still in the law. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so they were giving at that point because the grace tanks lost false doctrine. So you turn over to Galatians three. I'm seeing if I can find something. I don't know if I can find. Too and and John, I said then I had a conversation with John about this one day, and he really helped turn me around. All these people that are trying to put um, that that Paul writes about in almost every book that are trying to put us under the law, they were not 
the Pharisees or, or the apostate nation. They were, in fact, the little flock that didn't, that didn't have the understanding that they should have. They didn't want to have the understanding. Whatever, for whatever reason, that's that's who's doing this. Yeah, and that would be why Peter would have to say in Second Peter, okay, there's a lot of things that Paul teaches that are hard to be understood, but go read his writings. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so even Peter was saying you you need to go to, go to sure. Paul's writings to to get updated as right. to you know, what's going on. What's going on. Now. And the big issue there is everybody was saying, Peter, we sold all that we had. Where's the kingdom? You told me, you, you preached to me the gospel of the kingdom. Where is it? You better go read Paul because Paul's going to explain that. So look at Galatians 3. Oh, foolish, uh, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should obey the truth before whose... Oh, should not... <laughs> I've got my own writing in there. <laughs> that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you this only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? That, that question at the beginning, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? It's the little flock. Um, look at chapter 2, verse 11. Verse 7. Huh? Um, verse 7. But, con- but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel, this is the, you know, the big meeting, the gospel of the uncircumcision was commanded unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought affectionately in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. So there's an understanding in verse 9, right? And Cephas is Peter. Of, uh, th- th- there's an understanding there. There's a gospel of the circumcision. There's a gospel of the uncircumcision. It's something different. The, you know, eff- effectively, you know, in chapter in verse 9 there, that pretty much the, the Great Commission is... They, they put it on halt right there. They say, okay, we're not going to go to the rest of the world. We're going to go to our group, and that's good. So there's an agreement there. But now look at this. You get to verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood unto the face because he was to be blamed, to be blamed for before that certain came from who? From James. That's a little flock. That's a little flock. He did eat with the Gentiles when they were come. He withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Even Barnabas, who was Paul's fellow laborer, right. even he got caught up in this. This is no small issue that's going on back here. Yeah. Now this isn't the same James that wrote the epistle James. No, I would assume so. He was the leader of that church there in Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it'd been, it'd been there, yeah. You know, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have to look at the timeline on that. The, the more important thing for me is that the leader of the church in Jerusalem sent this, these people down to Peter, and Peter was living according to the doctrines that he had understood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then he, they get down there, and they say, and, and they they're putting all this pressure on Peter, so much so that it, apparently it spilled over on the Barnabas too. wrote a part of the scripture and people were coming from him and messed up. Mm-hmm. Oh wow, that's so great. Well, you know, yeah. God had revealed to Peter the Holy Spirit had come upon him, all of them, including him at, at Pentecost. And what did Peter say? This is that which is in Joel, which was the reference to the tribulation, the end. And it seems to me that they are being faithful to what God revealed to them in their gospel of the circumcision that truly the Jewish nation really needs to repent because that judgment is coming Mm -hmm. and they need to repent and be baptized and they are under the law 
So it seems to me like Peter went, if they shook on it, it's in agreement. He's to take his gospel to the circumcision. It seems to me, therefore, that Peter's letters, First and Second Peter, he is operating according to that light which the Holy Spirit gave him mm-hmm. for the Jews. And, um, mm-hmm. and that's why he says, if you look at First Peter, he says, yes. which the yeah. salvation will be revealed at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh-huh. It's not a future, it's not a present salvation. Right? No, it's not. Right. It's and it's and it's not this appearing. So, it's not the rapture appearing. It's not the rapture appearing. It's this appearing. And so it's the they're going forward with that to the to the Jewish nation, and Paul is taking the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. Right. And it just makes it so consistent then as you read and you see those things in 1st and 2nd Peter that are about, well, the grace which is coming to you at the appearing. That's another thing. We have that grace now. Right. They have to wait Wait, for it. And you can say, hold on to the end. Same thing, yeah. And the same thing, Peter says the same thing in Acts 3. He talks about their salvation is a future hope. Um, Now, this this is an interesting thing because this is a group that was taught the law. They were told, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. Not only do the Ten Commandments count, but your thoughts about the Ten Commandments thought. You know, if you think about a woman with lust, you, you have now committed adultery. You didn't have to do the act. Okay, so he's, he's kind of elevated the standard, right? So now, what they're not getting, they're not understanding that the program has changed. Right, right. Does that sound like anybody? Yeah, that way they. It's exactly how it is. Today. Isn't that something? The battle's the same. That was because the P- Peter and the apostles believed that the next part of the program was going to happen really soon. Yeah, right. And yeah. so did Paul, for that matter. Yes, he, he did. thought it was yes, all going right. to happen. Yes, he did. Soon. So they could coexist together, each with their own program. Absolutely. Focused on their own. I, I am in the camp. Right. I believe that Paul believed he was going to see the rapture. Yeah. yeah. And I think Peter thought he was going to see him go bye-bye. That's right. Look at Acts 1. And the kingdom was going to come. Yeah. Look, look at Acts 1. Jesus has, Jesus has been resurrected. He came back to meet with Pete and the eleven. They have a 40-day intense Bible study. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? That's a spot-on question. The answer to that should have been yes. There should have been a little de- delay. Unfortunately, our sh- our, this chart doesn't fold up. Th- this is not here. There should have been a little bit of delay here after the cross. The 70th week of Daniel, should have, the tribulation should have come. They sold all that they had. They, sh- they probably figured, well, okay, we had enough to get us through seven years. That's all they needed. Jesus Christ was going to come back. That's when their salvation was about to happen. And then there'd be the thousand year kingdom. That's what they're expecting. When, when Peter asks this, he's go, he, he can go, okay, he's been resurrected, he's come back, he's given me 40 day intense Bible study. Time for the kingdom, right? And, and they had the Holy Spirit which was putting a lot in their hearts that they thought Jesus sold their job. They were living in the community and they were doing it. There was no problem. There was no... Jealousy and envy and greed. But but even but 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 the law. This is what you're supposed to do, and you have now the power to do it. Right. In in Acts one, they haven't they haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. So that question is Peter just thinking this thing through. He's saying, okay, I know what the scriptures say. I spent three years with the man. He was died. He was resurrected. He came back to earth. I really didn't get that, but I get it now. I see the scriptures. I got forty days of intense Bible study. Okay, I can see this. I can see this. I can get the book of Daniel out. I say, hey. It's time for the kingdom, isn't it? And Jesus, you know, he says, you know what? It's not yours to know, but in a few days you're going to get the Holy Ghost. And then you're going to go out and you're going to do the Great Commission. Okay, I got it. I'm on board. And then all of a sudden, what in the heck happened? Who's this Paul dude? Where'd this come from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's still what's going on today. That's still what's going on today. In this, our church, my trouble is just, they want to mix them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They want to mix them. They're committed to mixing them, and we are not to say otherwise. I've got that message very 
confusion. Exactly. It it's does. exactly what the, yeah. the, was going on in Galatians is they wanted to mix them together. They said, yeah, you can believe the But then the I think that, you know, it's that first you be circumcised. Well, and then that goes back to that first verse that Dave talked about. You know, you, you study to not be ashamed. And if you're in confusion, there's some shame with that. It's like, I don't get it. I don't understand. Why, why can't I get it? Am I under covenant? And am I not? And then you're just you don't you don't feel good about yourself. There have when to you be know the truth, truth, and you know I mean I understand that this to, to rightly divide, and there's some there's some confidence with that. There's some peace yeah. with that. There's there's you know there's right. there's answers. There's answers, that, and I can stand boldly and explain. It's not like I have to be ashamed because I don't get it. You know. I will I will say again, and, and some of those have been with me for a while. It, it, hear me say this all the time. Are there contradictions in the Bible? Every good-hearted, believing Christian that doesn't understand right division will say no. And they'll take two things that are so diametrically opposed that a five-year-old knows they're opposite and they have to allegorize it. Or rationalize, to, or, rationalize or do something to make them... There are differences. You know what? There are not contradictions in Paul's epistles. There are not contradictions in, between the Gospels and Hebrews through Revelation. In, within the program, within your own program, there are not contradictions in the Bible. If you want to compare the grace, the, the mystery program with the prophecy program, there are contradictions. That's why I said earlier, that's a great opportunity. Well, why don't you show me one of the contradictions and we'll talk about it. Yeah. You bet. Just today just struck me so much. It's nothing new to you guys, I know. But it's Luke 12, 31 to 33. We hear this so often in church. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And then verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And then, this is what our pastor preached this summer, verse 33. Sell what you have, that you have, and give alms. Oh, but that doesn't really mean that. <laughs> Jesus was not telling us to sell all that we have. He just seems meant pretty clear. generous and share. Oh and he said that how could we be good stewards if yeah. um, if we sold all that we have? Yeah, yeah he's, he's teaching And I agree with that, that statement that he made, and I don't agree with that statement. It, it, it's very true, and it's very appalling. How can you be, if you sell all that you have, how can you be good stewards with it? Paul doesn't tell you to tell you. He says, you don't take care of your own family, you're worse than an infidel. Okay, here's a per that's a perfect place. Th this is a contradiction. Don't say it's not a contradiction. It is. But, but, so there's got to be an answer. What's... He didn't tell them to sell it. He tells them to be on guard because you may have a problem. The riches may get in the way of your right thinking. But then you, you, go look at what he tells the rich in First Timothy. Yeah. Charge them that are rich in this world that they sell all that they have and give it to the poor. That the first Timothy six seventeen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, which but in the living, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. What's that? Oh, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works ready to distribute, willing to communicate. If you've, sold, I, if you've sold all that you had, you cannot distribute. Right, right. Those are different. Yeah. And, and, and you said that your pastor said he didn't mean that. That Jesus, Jesus didn't mean did it. not mean that. I thought, that is blasphemy. I can't bring my international students to a pastor who's going to say that about any words that Jesus speaks. Right. Yeah. And there's an example of it. In, in, yeah. That's exactly what they did. That's yeah, they did. They understood it. Yeah. Why was Paul... When, when Paul says, I'm taking up a collection for the poor saints of Jerusalem, he's not describing them other than the reality of the is they're poor. They don't have any money. They sold what they had. Because the program was interrupted. That's right. That's exactly right. They were being obedient to their program. To, to the Holy Spirit, their program. And they were, they were, but they were complete obedient. But that's not us. That's not, uh, we are yeah. not them. Yeah. 
So if Jesus didn't mean it when he said sell that you had, how do you know he meant it when he said love your neighbor? Right. Thank you. How can we believe anything he said? Yeah, yeah. I can't I can't bear this. That's shaming. You if know, the Bible doesn't mean it when it says sell all that you had, how do you know that when the Bible says Jesus was the propitiation it means it? Those are. I had. I had to just. What'd you say, what'd, what'd you say Bill? Yeah, I, I had a conversation with a young man, and a long conversation all the way up and down the coast one day, and we got we got out, and he finally said, "Well, you know, I actually do believe that Jesus was resurrected," and I go, "Why do you believe that? We spent four, you, we spent three hours here. You tell me you don't believe anything in the Bible. Why would you believe of all the things in the Bible to believe? Why would you believe that?" And it gave him great pause. And then I found out several weeks later, his mom called me and said, you know, he, he actually did give me a testimony of salvation. Because when you start asking that question, the, the, the goal here is not to be argumentative. The goal, the goal here is to rely on the Word of God. Are you going to take human viewpoint? Jesus didn't mean what he said when he said that is human viewpoint. Because I know what God's viewpoint is. Because it's written down on the pages. We, 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 over the last few weeks, we've looked at all those verses about the Word of God and the Word of God given us light and the Word of God is truth. It either is truth or it's not. And so, this will affect our thinking. Now, these, these, these are kind of, if I can put it this way, these are easy ones to see. What happens is now you come down to, and you, then that, you, take, you take those that are easy to understand. It says one thing over here and it says another thing over here. I understand that we're going to, you know, we don't sell all that we have. We're good stewards with our money. I understand how that works out and the difference in the program. So now then, when you, when you have that guilt for your sin, and, and, and you know, maybe, maybe I'm not forgiven for that one. You have, to, you have to apply that same standard to it. When you have that moment, when, you, when, when you're alone, and you've done whatever you've done, you've had the thought you've had, whatever it is, and you think, God's not happy with me. Okay. You've got to apply the same standard to your thinking. Because you are accepted in the beloved. Nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And now, it's no longer, it, it's no longer that, that, that issue of bringing people to see some things. It's, it, it's the issue where it, does, where it affects your life. It affects the walk that you have day by day, and it's how you get victory in life. People say we think we wear this out, and I, I beg to differ. I scream to differ. If you want to get out of the Bible what God wants you to get out of it, if you want to have victory in life, you have got to understand the Bible rightly divided. Anything other than that is you're going to put yourself back under the law and back on that religious treadmill that we see in Romans 7. Okay, I, I want to do good. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And guess what? You can do X, you can do Z, you can't do Y. So now you feel terrible. I'm going to try really hard tomorrow. And we've all been here. And you, you do it tomorrow. And you know what? Today you got X and Y, but you couldn't get Z. Okay. Tomorrow I got it. Now you, you, tomorrow's a disaster. You don't get any of them. And now you feel worse. And what happens? <laughs> Back, I did keep a journal. I mean, that thing was so so vicious. They scribbled. I was so angry at myself because I was trying so hard every day to get that list A, A B, C, X, Y, Z done. And you and just couldn't do it. I couldn't. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's um, no peace in that. Trying to serve the Lord or trying to live the, the, the godly life in, in, your, in your own um, efforts is just like trying to go to sleep. Hmm. You, there's only one way to fall asleep, and that is to not let it go. Try. Yeah. But as soon as you start trying to go to sleep, you're awake all night long. And it's the same way with trying to serve the Lord in your own flesh, in your right. own abilities. It's the same thing. It's just a struggle. Mm -hmm. It's a struggle that you cannot win. We don't study the Word of God rightly divided so we can win the argument. While we need to bring everybody, we, we need, you know, is God's will that all men get saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We all have issues in our lives of people that we love and care deeply about, that we want, you know, we're, we're so excited. Man, just let me show you a couple things. Whatever. 
and, and, and they don't care. And, and that is so important. But don't forget, right division is the secret to victory in your life. It will release you from the guilt. It will release you from the self-condemnation. It will stop you from trying to earn some blessings that you couldn't earn in your best day anyhow because they don't belong to you. You don't have a place in the earthly kingdom. You're not sitting on one of the twelve thrones. You're not sitting under you're not sitting under any of the people sitting on those twelve thrones. Your hope is heavenly. You have grace and peace from God the Father today. And I was going to go through the whole chart. I think based on this conversation we don't need to do the to do that. So we're about forty five. Okay. Wow. Uh, <laughs> we got a tape. <laughs> it's for victory in life. If you want to have victory in life, you need to approach the scriptures rightly divided. You can, it, 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 right. You, you can't make another person believe this or, or see this. But you can you can understand the Bible rightly divided, and that and and you can see what's going on in your life, and you can apply the the word of truth to your life in that manner, in a manner that that will actually work and 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 edify. You know, we're we're just gonna when we're, we'll start Romans five next week, and we're gonna jump into it with a bang because we're gonna see that we have peace with God and we have access to God. But then the next thing we're gonna deal with is tribulation. The, 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 the second thing Paul tells us, for, first of all, he tells us that be, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. So there's, a, there's an issue, there's no more enmity between us and God. But the first life issue, if I can put it that way, that he's going to deal with when he gets to Romans 5, after our justification, is this issue of tribulation. Is there anybody that doesn't have tribulation in their life? And he's going to tell you the very first thing is it doesn't mean I'm mad at you. you get, it means it works and experience. And you know, that was so important to know because in all of the Old Testament, when Israel was suffering tribulation, it was because God was angry with them. And it, it is. Yeah. 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 And we're, what, what we're going to do is when we look at this issue of peace, to set us up for the issue of tribulation, God being mad at us, we're going to go back into the Old Testament and we're going to see what would have happened to us if this hadn't been here. We're going to see that kind of lack of peace with God as, as, on, on a dispensational setting. And then we're going to go back and we're going to see what Israel, what it looked like in a, in, a, in a person's walk not to have peace with God. And we're going to say, you know what? We got that. Yeah, we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, because that's the big thing, right? It, it's, it's that issue of, of to think gain is godliness. We all get tribulation in our life. And the first thing we always want to think is what's God trying to teach me? Is there something wrong in my life? Do I have some unconfessed sin somewhere that I need to come up with? No. You're in tribulation because you live in the sin-cursed world, but you know what? You're saved now. You have peace with me, and I'm going to use it. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, you're going to learn some things from it. And the, 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 the ultimate thing is you're not going to be ashamed, and you're going to come to an understanding that the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts. Oh my gosh. Wow. Totally changes the way you look at tribulation. You get past that, okay. Now, you get past that, you're going to find out you're eternally secure, and then you're going to find out you're dead to sin, and then you're going to find out that you're dead to the law, and then you're going to find out you're dead to the flesh, and then you're going to find out nothing can separate you from the love of God. And you go, wow, this is awesome! And it totally changes the way you live your life. And you're an ambassador, it's not your home. Right. And then all of a sudden you go, I got it, I, I understand. Let me tell you about it. And they go, okay, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then, and then, that's right. And then, and then you know what? Your daughter, or your son, or your husband, or your wife, or your pastor, or your coworker, they're going to have a problem. And you're going to say, you know, I just, I think God's punishing me. And you can say, can I show you some things? And you know what? It's no longer going to be an academic discussion. It's going to be a discussion where all of a sudden they see it working in your life 
and you show them a couple of verses, and they go, wow, I get it. God's not mad at me. This is happening. Wow. That the Holy Spirit is, is, is bringing light to them because the Holy right. Spirit is in us. It's totally. Easy, right. You know? And I just see the difference when some people like you guys, you share a verse with me. It hits me so hard. And, you know, sometimes people can share verses. That, I don't know, where that, but it doesn't do the same thing. And I just think it's the Holy Spirit in in people that makes it. And, and, and I'm not saying it's just you. Some, whoever is. Sure it is. Filled, yeah. If they give us a word, you know, it, from the scripture, it all of a sudden it really pops out, right? Did you have that? Yeah. It is the Holy Spirit working in you. There's a teaching that you can't grieve the Holy Spirit. You can't resist God. Yes, you can. We looked at that this morning in the garden, right? What did they do? They resisted God. They, okay, and, and you, Paul talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. The reason that works is because you are willing to believe the verse. The Word of God works effectually in you that believe. That's not about salvation. Do you believe the verse or not? Do you believe that this is the word, that this is the truth? When everything, when all the circumstances of life and everything in you says this, and the word of God says that, and everything says we gotta trust over here, but the word of God says, no, you gotta trust over here. What do you trust? And that's hard. I, I know I I have the same struggle. That's difficult. That's difficult. Because what do we want to say? Yeah, but. That verse means it in that person's situation, but not in mine. God didn't know this was going to happen in my life. My situation is different. I'm special. I'm special. special. <laughs> my problem is special. <laughs> Isn't it, 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 it? Everybody, everybody, what's that? I know that you, that you might know it offhand. I could look it up, but there's a verse about. Be ready, but be gentle in the way you. Yeah, we talked about it uh, last week. So it's. Uh, you must not strive, but be gentle. I think it's First Timothy. Two, three. Yeah. No. Oh come on! We all looked at it last week. Yeah, we Oh, 2.24. Servant of the Lord must not strive, be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. How do people oppose themselves? Put themselves back into the law, not understand the identity of who they are in Christ. Right, Living in a different identity than what they are. Living under the law, not under grace. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, yep. who are taken captive by him at his will. What's the snare of the devil today? The law. The law. Yeah. The earth program. Yeah. Make yeah. Yeah. Anything yeah. to keep us out of the heavenly. That's yeah. 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 Here's the, what, what's a snare? It's kind of a trick. right? A snare, you, you don't see it coming. Yeah. Oh, you need to do good for God. You need to do it. You need to do this, this, and this so, you, so that God's happy with you. Okay, good. I got it. Whoop. You're in the, you're in the snare. Yeah. How do you get out of that? Right division. Study the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth because you're supposed to acknowledge the truth. Thank you guys pray for me this week because I'm like you said about it. I would just really appreciate praying for that because with my husband I'm becoming defensive. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's just isn't, you know, it's, it's discrediting. Yeah, it is. And so, that, I just really appreciate that, you know, I just have And that's a good verse to remember. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's a very good verse. Man, I don't know what it is about Corvallis, but you guys' clocks go faster down here or something. Time, time, time moves fast down here. Of course, I did this morning too, but this morning I thought I'd been talking about five minutes and it was close to an hour. So, well, let's, um, let's say a prayer and we'll turn the camera off and if we want to talk more, we certainly can. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come together and study your word, freely study your word. We can gather in, in our country, Lord, and um, let's take a moment and uh, as we studied this morning in our group, Lord, 
uh, we do want to pray for the leaders of our country, that they will um, make decisions with wisdom and understand that what their role is, understand the gravity of the office that they have. Um, from the from the president, the new president, all the way down to, the, to our local mayors in those offices, Lord. Um, but for us, Lord, I would pray that we would be constantly daily daily in your word, understanding, studying your word and understanding it, understanding it rightly divided so that we can, in fact, acknowledge the truth. And it seems like everybody in this room right now, Lord, has somebody that they're, they're, they're having this discussion with. And, and as we all know, there's a lot of pushback. And, it, and the conversations can get heated and they can get frustrated. And, and sometimes one or both parties can lose their cool. And I would pray that we would all take these last verses we looked at. Lord, not be strifeful and be meek and understanding that we just share the things. Let, let your words speak. We just share them and then let the Holy Ghost do the job. Um, that is the Holy Ghost job. Our job is to share it. The Holy Ghost job is to illuminate it, Lord. And we give you praise and we give you glory in all things. In your name, amen.